Okay, members, we now move on to questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and I call Patsy McGlone. Question number one, uh, Kesh Deverdehien, I can call you. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I wish to group questions one and five together. Under the terms of the UK Withdrawal Agreement Bill, which embodies the Northern Ireland Protocol, Northern Ireland is required to align with the European Union's sanitary and phytosanitary rules, an agreement made by the UK and EU, which was not supported by any unionist party in Northern Ireland and runs contrary to the Belfast Agreement 1998. I am opposed to the detrimental impact of these additional rules on Northern Ireland businesses and consumers specifically the barriers they place on the movement of animals, goods and products from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. I therefore continue to engage with ministerial colleagues and the UK Government to press this position. Ultimately, the protocol needs to go. I am firmly of the view that any product which enters Northern Ireland as its end destination should not go under any checks. There are practical solutions for products which enter the EU single market via the Republic of Ireland. There should be no barriers to trade within the UK internal market any barriers are wholly unacceptable and go against the requirement of unfettered trade underpinning the Act of Union. Supplementary, Pazin McGlone. Gormagri, Can I ask the Minister just uh, to date uh, what level of compensation either has been paid or is likely to be paid to contractors and those associated with the, the uh, schemes at the points of entry uh, by the Department? That is not something I am aware of. It is not something that I have engaged in. I have part- taken uh, no role in that nor participated in it. Um, what I would say is that, as a consequence of the protocol, um, the estimations now that when the grace period ends is that there will be some 15,000 checks per week. That is something which is going to have damaging impact on every nationalist, every unionist and every other person in Northern Ireland. So we do better not to have any uh, new buildings constructed and not to have any checks on food that is going to end up in tables in Northern Ireland uh, coming from Great Britain. I call Jim Allister. Does the Minister agree or disagree with Peter Robinson that you cannot credibly oppose the protocol while at the same time implementing it? Well, in the first instance, um, not once have I authorised any infrastructure. This has been imposed by Westminster, paid for by Westminster, to hit the demands of Dublin and indeed the pro protocol parties, that is Sinn Féin, SDLP, Alliance and Green Party. And as a result, every consumer will feel the pain of this protocol. We are still not satisfied with the onerous burdens and checks that are being imposed, these parties want more because they want the rigorous implementation of it. And one might expect that from Republicans because they don't mind wreaking damage on the wider community for their own ends. But for the Alliance Party to be co-conspirators and cheerleaders for things like locking up ponies needlessly, for ensuring that pets have medical interventions which are not required. For the food in your cupboard to cost more, for supplies to business to be disrupted, for partial deliveries to be detrimentally impacted. So what I would say is that is what the Alliance Party and the Republicans are delivering. I want to see it removed. I call Alan Chambers. Mr. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister what consultations have taken place with the pedigree societies in GB over the issues involving the protocol, such as animals with a UK prefix tag having to be re-tagged with a Northern Ireland prefix tag? Mr. Chambers raises a very valid point, and all of the pedigree uh, societies are being impacted as a consequence of the protocol. And in terms of what they are selling, the integrity of the product that they are selling is being impacted um, because of the very issue that he raises about tags having to be changed uh, from being UK tags. And this is something that, again, is unacceptable, again, is something that we are raising. But it demonstrates that we have raised numerous issues in regards to this protocol. The problem isn't that it's got issues wrong with it. The problem lies at the heart of the protocol. It is wrong, and it needs to go. 
I call Keeve Archibald. Can Colleen, I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Does the Minister agree that the obvious solution to restore unfettered movement of goods from Britain to the North is for the British Government to align with the EU's standards and regulations, and for example, on SPS? That is a possibility, and it is for the British Government to consider that. But what is also a possibility is that any goods which is being consumed in Northern Ireland, any product that is coming to Northern Ireland which is going to remain in Northern Ireland, will have no detrimental impact on the European Union single market. And Mr Coveney, Mr Varadkar and Mr Martin could tell the European Union that that is the case and support us in getting this protocol removed. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you. And thank the Minister for, for the answers to his question. Minister, could you outline to the House what your plan and timescale would be uh, to remove the protocol, given the, given the possibility that you are likely to end up as First Minister in this House? Well, I think uh, I have indicated that I have no desire to, to hold that position, and, and, and that is one thing. But at every opportunity, I have raised the damage that the protocol is doing to Northern Ireland, both verbally and orally. The UK Government and the European Union are aware of the harm that it is causing and the significant further pain that will be inflicted as a consequence of the end of the grace periods because it is self-evident. And they know that the protocol is not fit for purpose, it has been a mistake and must be replaced. So in January of this year, I instructed my officials uh, to get senior counsel opinion from a top UK constitutional lawyer. And on return to office, an eminent QC was appointed and is currently scrutinising every aspect of that protocol. On completion of that piece of work, it is my intention to lodge judicial proceedings against the protocol. I would hope that the Department for Economy and indeed the Department for Health, because this is having major implications for both medicines and medical devices, will join with me in taking an action against the European Go Union and the UK Government for the damage that it is inflicting on all of the people of Northern Ireland. Questions two and four are withdrawn, and I call Trevor Clark. Question number three. With your permission, Mr Speaker, I wish to group questions three and seven together. The eradication of bovine TB is one of my top priorities. I can rec recognise the devastating emotional and financial impact a, B a BTB breakdown can have on farming families across Northern Ireland. A new BTB eradication strategy for Northern Ireland will aim to reduce and eventually eradicate BTB by comprehensively addressing all of the recognised key factors in the maintenance and spread of the disease. I can advise that my officials have completed the business case required to support the implementation of a new strategy. And I have now received final advice on a proposed way forward. This will assist me in deciding on the next steps necessary to tackle BTB in Northern Ireland. It is my intention to launch a consultation on my preferred way forward in the very near future, and I welcome the opportunity that this will provide for stakeholders and the wider public to express their views on how we can best work together to tackle this disease. Trevor Clark, supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for the answer? Can the Minister outline maybe when he foresees the consultation um, actually been launched and the agreed way forward in relation to what is probably widely known as a costly disease to both animal and human uh, health, and never mind the actual cost to the taxpayer itself? I thank the member for the question. It did cost the Northern Ireland taxpayer some £37 million last year, and that has been something which has been in and around that ballpark for quite a number of years now. And I believe that you know, roughly £40 million could be better spent elsewhere um, than doing the same thing over and over and over again um, and not actually dealing uh, with bovine TB. So work is continuing apace. The business case for the strategy has been completed, and I have now received final advice for my consideration. So it is my intention to engage with officials with a view to launching a consultation on the preferred way forward um, imminently. And once I have considered responses to that consultation, I will finalise the strategy and have made it clear that I wish to see the implementation of the new BTB strategy as soon as practically possible in 2021. I call Gary Middleton. 
you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that we need to tackle uh, TB both in wildlife and cattle uh, to actually deliver a healthier wildlife population? Uh, absolutely. And wildlife intervention has already happened uh, both in England and the Republic of Ireland. I have spent um, considerable time with uh, the, the veterinary scientists in uh, both jurisdictions, and their advice is very, very clear that if we are to rid the wildlife population of TB and we are to rid the bovine population of TB, then you have to take actions in both the wildlife and bovine population. Up to now, we have only taken actions in the bovine population, and therefore um, the logic of continuing to do that and not tackling the issue at, at, the, at the wildlife um, part, it, it just does not exist. So the, 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 I think that the, the definition of madness is to keep doing the same thing and expect different answers. And some people would suggest that I do that. I am afraid that I cannot do that because we really need to get on top of this problem, stop wasting public money and stop putting individuals through immense stress and mental health um, issues as a consequence of doing nothing about a long-term problem. I call Pat Kedney. Thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. Minister, uh, will you publish the final concluding report on the test to vaccinate or remove wildlife intervention study on badgers and bovine uh, TB? And can you tell this House, have you secured the additional funding to replace the $5.1 million lost from the TB eradication programme as a result of Brexit? Thank you. Well, our, our business uh, plan identifies all of those issues, and that case will be made to the Department of Finance. Um, if we require additional money, it will be on the basis of invest to save, because ultimately we will be driving the costs of TB down, um, but there is a course of work to be done there. Um, the TBR um, was a useful scheme, gave us a lot of scientific evidence um, of the links between um, wildlife and indeed between bovine populations. And the strains, and there is a large number of strains of, of, of TB, as there is, we learnt um, a, a wide range of strains of, of COVID 19, for example. But the range of strains will exist between the wildlife and bovine population in particular areas. So the linkage is, is irrefutable, and, and therefore um, the evidence base for moving forward is something which is very clear. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Minister, thank you for your answer so far. Minister, has any progress been made on the biosecurity of cattle ear tags, given that occasionally the carcass of an animal in a meat factory is found infected with BTV, and yet the DNA does not match that of the mother? It is highly unusual. It can happen, but it is highly unusual. They call it Tagla Magalier. Um, can I ask the Minister, the Minister will be aware of the, the, the recent animal health law that has come into effect. Um, has his department carried any uh, impact assessment of the implications this will have for farmers? Yes, this is a piece of European legislation um, that has been uh, brought forward by the European Parliament um, and the European Commission, uh, which we have no role uh, in making that legislation. We have no role in amending that legislation and demonstrates the perversity of the situation that we find ourselves in and that we are expected to implement legislation where there has been no representation. And, uh, I join with the nationalists of many years ago in saying that that is wrong. We cannot have uh, legislation without representation, uh, and that is entirely uh, inappropriate. And it does have an impact upon the farming community in that uh, they will be required uh, to engage in testing at own cost uh, before taking their animals to, to a livestock mart, uh, and that will have a significant uh, impact uh, for those farmers. Nicole Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question six. I thank the member for the question. And Dara, uh, tackling rural poverty and isolation program, currently funds the rural support charity the Farm Family Health Checks Programme and the Spring Social Prescribing Project 
which supports mental well-being in farming communities. The Rural Support Charity operates a telephone helpline and signposting service for farmers and their families. Their experienced volunteers and mentors also meet with and provide continuous support to clients with a range of issues pertaining to farming matters and mental stress. Their ongoing outreach programme is targeted at farmers and farm families to help strengthen the farm business and build personal resilience. The Farm Families Health Check programme also provides support to farmers and has to date screened the physical and mental health and well-being of over 20,000 individuals, primarily farmers, farm workers and farm family members attending March and community events. Rural Support and Farm Family Health Checks programme staff recently collaborated to create an initiative called Protecting the Asset That Is You, which is providing key health messages to farmers, farm families and rural communities using social media platforms. The Spring Social Subscribing Programme, which is delivered in partnership with eight rural healthy living centres, links medical care to non-clinically local delivers services by enabling medical professionals to refer rural patients to social subscribers and ultimately to a range of activities and services. Although the Department of Health have lead responsibility for mental health services, I believe that across government we all have a role to play, as well as those specific schemes that farmers can access We are supporting a range of activities to make outdoor recreation more accessible, encourage greater community participation and engagement, and as we emerge from the challenges of COVID-19, getting people outdoors and active will greatly enhance their mental well-being. DERA are currently developing a new rural policy framework to shape future priorities and includes a draft goal to reduce loneliness and social exclusion in rural areas, to minimise the impacts of rural isolation and promote the health and well-being of rural dwellers, the outworkings of which will promote positive health and well-being for farmers and indeed the wider rural community. Paula Bradley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for a very uh, detailed answer. Minister, um, we know within those families there are many women, and women play a very important role within this industry. Can I just ask what specifically engagement you have had with uh, those women involved in agriculture? Well, in terms of uh, the engagement that we have across the board, um, it is quite extensive. Um, rural support uh, would, in particular, uh, provide um, a lot of support for um, the female um, members of the rural population. I would have to say that on most farms, um, women are very often the backbone of, of the show. So very often the man is out seen on the, on the front, front line of, of it. Uh, but uh, the, the, the women tend to do an awful lot of the paperwork, provide an awful lot of the supporting work, and you know keep keep uh, the show on the road as such. And they face immense pressures as well. Um, farming is, is a difficult, difficult business at times. Um, cash flow can be serious problems. Weather conditions can can cause problems. And the subject we've just concluded on TB is one that is causing huge mental stress as people lose substantial parts of their herds and uh, the, 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 the mental health impact of that is massive. That impact that, 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 that is on um, the gentleman who happens to be leading the farm um, is, is perhaps more evident, but the, the lady who, who may uh, be a bit in the background, um, it is also there too. And we need to ensure that the support is available to every person uh, that needs it in the rural communities, and the women uh, in our rural communities are absolutely vital um, to its well-being. I call Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, can I just uh, take the opportunity to wish my uh, Lagan Valley colleague all the best in his uh, leadership uh, competition with the MP Geoffrey Donaldson in Lagan Valley. Um, Minister, you've been asked every week about mental health, which is good in your role as the Minister for Agriculture. What are the clinical and non-clinical findings from the rollout? Of the well-being and mental health programmes. In terms of it, we have identified that mental health in rural areas is a considerable problem. So we have identified issues such as isolation, uh, loneliness, anxiety, financial hardship, and uh, we're focusing on community development approaches, uh, seeking to rule out preventative activities to address matters identified at a local level, and. Over 75,000 rural dwellers have benefited from this initiative um, from the December 20 to, to March 21 period. 
And we have other trips he funded initiatives, such as the enhancement of forest parks, development of community trails, utilisation of school facilities for community use, regeneration of disused historic buildings in rural communities, access and inclusion grant aid scheme to enhance disabled access and uses of public buildings, continued uh, funding for rural support networks and small grant schemes to assist the rural community and voluntary sector. So we take these things seriously. Call Nicola Brogan. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. On the topic of mental wellbeing, um, many anglers and locals in the Jamore and Fenton area of West Rhone have been left completely devastated by the major pollution incident at the weekend, which resulted in thousands of fish being killed along the five kilometre stretch of the Ahalisk River. Can the Minister outline what actions his department are taking to deal with the serious incident? This is a pretty, a pretty um, shocking um, pollution um, of that waterway and it is something that I am absolutely appalled that has happened. Um, my, my officials are, are on the ground in the area um, seeking to assist, seeking to mitigate, but essentially uh, there is huge damage done and won't be rectified for years as a consequence of almost certainly um, someone not doing their job right. Um, so we will go through the process of identifying. Um, go through the process of, of, of taking them to court, of <coughs> ensuring that all costs are attributed um, to the individual who, who um, caused the pollution. Um, but all of that does not undo the damage that is done. Uh, it, it, is, it deals with, with the individual who done it, but it does not undo the damage. And I would encourage everybody um, who is involved in business, in agriculture, or anything other, whether it is potential of um, materials um, getting into our waterways to take every action possible to ensure that is not the case. Come on, story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of another devastating event that took place some 22 years ago in my own constituency with the destruction of the then Lovell and Christmas bacon plant uh, that was my former employer. And obviously, it had a huge impact on the mental well-being as well as the uh, business community, and particularly the farming community and the pig industry in my constituency. Will he join with me today in welcoming the fact that Barnside Foods have now published a plan to Cosby Coast and Glen's planning, submitted on Friday, with the potential of 400 jobs and a £75 million investment? That surely is good for the mental health and the economic prosperity of the farming community in my constituency. That indeed is a very exciting proposal, and it has been tremendous um, to see agri-food growing um, over this past decade and indeed generation. I remember dealing with farmers in the back of the Lovell and, and, and Christmas factory being burnt, and the devastation that, that caused. It drove many of them out of business at that time, uh, and I visited many of them, and it was a, an awful circumstance. And of course, the, the, you and, and your fellow uh, colleagues. In that factory, also lost their jobs, um, which was devastating. So it's very exciting news that 400 jobs um, could be created, and it demonstrates to us uh, that we need to be really wise when it comes to the proposed climate change legislation, because agri-food is such a large sector in Northern Ireland um, that we can make our significant contribution to carbon reduction without annihilating the agri-food sector. Because, you know, taking 50% of beef and taking 50% of dairy production out of Northern Ireland, mark my words, will annihilate the agri-food sector, will annihilate the rural community. And if people are genuine about mental health and about distress, they should think very carefully before they put their hand to something which is causing real stress in the rural community and give a very bit more consideration to us all finding a way forward on the issue of climate change and carbon production. The next question I call George Robinson. Jeanette, uh, Mr. Speaker. My department has an annual programme to maintain and improve infrastructure at angling waters, including the provision of a disabled angling stands and improved pathways. Some of these waters are located in the lower band catchment, such as Movanagher. Port Nah, the Balamoni River, etc. Consideration is being given for the plans to improve the access road and fishing stands 
at Movanagher Canal. The Department has also continued to stock the MPAE waters throughout the COVID pandemic, as well as carrying out maintenance and improvement works at over 90 PAE waters. My officials also work closely with the Honourable the Irish Society, Waterways Ireland and many angling clubs on the Lower Band tributary rivers to improve angling and fisheries habitat in the area. Finally, my Department's management of salmon stocks and conservation measures has helped to stabilise and possibly to start the recovery of numbers of Atlantic salmon returning to the Ban Ne catchment to spawn. This should help to attract and increase recreational salmon anglers to the Lower Ban. Supplementary, George Robinson. Thank the Minister for his answer. And looking to the future, when our tourist trade resumes, would the Minister agree that angling, either river or sea angling, in my East Londonderry constituency and other constituencies will play an important role in the future of our tourism economy? And can the Minister ensure that all action, and no he probably has answered this, that all action can be taken to minimise the pollution issue which happened overnight in the Oglish River in County Tyrone? The member is absolutely right, and the value of um, the tourism sector and angling in that sector is absolutely phenomenal. Um, so we really need to look after this, and we really need to ensure um, that these incidents don't take place. Sadly, they do, but we really need to ensure um, that we do everything in our power to stop it, and that individuals recognise their responsibilities in ensuring that it doesn't happen. Call Stuart Dixon. Um, so Minister, for, for um, question number nine, the, the, member, the member John Blair hadn't been Question number so nine. I've moved on. Under the terms of the withdrawal agreement, the Northern Ireland Protocol and domestic legislation, Northern Ireland must continue to align with the EU, e, European Union's sanitary and phytosanitary SPS rules. I am firmly opposed to the detrimental impact of these newly mandated rules on Northern Ireland business and consumers and the barriers they place on intra-UK movement of animals, goods and products from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. As such, I believe we must get to a position whereby we must minimise the impact of these checks and remove them entirely. Discussions are ongoing between the United Kingdom Government and the European Commission via the UK-EU Joint Committee aiming to find what I hope will be viable solutions on a range of issues related to Northern Ireland Protocol, including SPS checks. The establishment of common uh, SPS area under the terms of a potential UK-EU veterinary agreement um, could assist in facilitating trade in live animals and agri-food products, um, which would be helpful. However, it would not address the entirety of the rules associated with the implementation of the protocol and therefore um, cannot properly uh, address the issue. I have already engaged with my ministerial colleagues and will continue to engage with them to explore all available options that can uh, help us to remove the protocol and its impact upon Northern Ireland uh, GB trade. Nevertheless, responsibility on the future alignment of the UK within the EU, EU SPS rules, as well as the negotiation of any EU UK veterinary agreement, rests solely with the UK Government. A brief supplementary, Mr Dixon, please. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Minister, listening to your answer, it does actually sound as if you are engaged in doing practical things to deal with the protocol. And can I, may I take this opportunity to congratulate you on that and to, to encourage you to continue down that route rather than perhaps a route of uh, trying to oppose the protocol? Well, the, 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 the member... What welcomes doing things which reduces the impact of the protocol, and, and I welcome those things which reduce the impact of it. But ultimately, it is you know we, we, we do we do something which helps, for example, on um, potatoes coming into Northern Ireland or, or um, other materials coming into Northern Ireland, but it leaves so much other things which are so negatively impacted. So ultimately. We need to deal with what is the underlying problem. The underlying problem is the protocol. Northern Ireland does not pose a threat to the European Union single market. And consequently, the goods that enter Northern Ireland from Great Britain, all part of the United Kingdom single market, should not be checked because they do not pose a threat to the single market. 
This is a political decision that was taken at the behest of the Irish Government, but it is damaging Irish people who live in Northern Ireland, and they need to pull back from it and ensure that Northern Ireland is treated fairly and equitably within the United Kingdom. That ends the period for a list of questions. And I will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Keeb Archibald. Um, this is Firefighter Memorial Day, so would the Minister join with me in recognising those firefighters who have lost their lives in the line of duty and in sending solidarity to their families today, and also in expressing our gratitude to all of our heroic firefighters and also the Irish Air Corps um, for their efforts recently in tackling the devastating wildfires in the Morns? I thank the member for the question, and what she says has, is entirely valid and correct. Um, I spent uh, time with the firefighters uh, in the morns um, just uh, around 10 days ago, and it was a devastating fire, uh, but it wasn't the first, and our firefighters have been out since that, and were out before that this year, and are out every year, and it doesn't get the media profile because they don't, you know, the wider public. And don't say it, it's more localised. So well done to our firefighters who not only are out on the mountains fighting fires, but they're rescuing um, farmers who've got themselves into trouble, for example, slurry tanks, very dangerous circumstances, um, all sorts of things they're called out to in terms of farms and in terms of rural communities. And I think particularly of a lot of the road traffic collisions that take place you know, on our rural roads. And the first people who are there are the fire, fire, fire and rescue service, um, cutting people out of cars, doing spectacular work, uh, and say, saying very little about it, just getting on with their job. It's a very stressful job, um, and I think it's something that you're absolutely right. They do need all the praise that we can give them. Supplementary, Keeve Archibald. And I thank the Minister for that response, and I concur with what he says. And given the, the crucial north-south aspect to tackling these fires and the many other cross-border um, issues relating to agriculture, the environment and our rural communities, will the Minister give his commitment to working cooperatively and in a collaborative way um, through the north-south institutions and, in particular, the north-south ministerial council on all those issues within his remit which affect our communities north and south and which impact on an all-island basis? In, in my role, I have every desire um, to work uh, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland. That, that is something that I don't have an issue with at all, uh, where it is in the mutual interests of both our countries. It is in the mutual interests of both our countries that people in Northern Ireland are not um, experiencing the damage and impacts of the protocol, and, and therefore uh, I think that colli colleagues in, in the Republic of Ireland, political colleagues, would do well to reflect upon that and work with us um, in doing so, and work with us on, on other key issues which can help both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland prosper. That is what we want. Well, Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, could you explain to the House the reasoning, the rationale and the stage that you are at in relation to your proposal to scrap the Agricultural Wages Board? Well, for years we were told, and, and virtually all parties said, we needed to reduce quangos. Now, this is a quango. So uh, I uh, actually haven't went back in my word in terms of um, reducing quangos. And this particular one, uh, it doesn't exist in any other sector. We don't have a health wages board. We don't have an education wages board. You know, we don't have a builder's wages board. Uh, so. You know, the Agricultural Wages Board was there whenever agricultural wages were very low, when we didn't have uh, minimum pay, when we didn't have a series of other uh, things that were put in place in terms of pensions, in terms of sick pay, in terms of maternity, paternity pay, and all of those things. Um, so much of what the work that the Agricultural Wages Board would have done in the past is obviated as a consequence of all of the other things that have happened. And therefore, there is no point in keeping a quango whenever it is entirely unnecessary. Supplementary, Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, Minister, effectively, you are echoing the words of the Ulster Farmers Union and their rationale behind uh, wishing to scrap the Agricultural Wages Board. You've 
you have cited a range of other types of employment, but all of them have very uh, highly uh, well-developed uh, collective bargaining and other uh, negotiating arrangements mm -hmm. for pay. The agricultural sector is one that is not really heavily trade unionised, is one where people live in very rural and, and d diverse and, and uh, widely spaced uh, communities. And therefore, I believe, and I think you should reflect on the matter uh, and join the trade union movement uh, in suggesting that we need to retain the Agricultural Wages Board for the very reasons that I have outlined, that this is a group of people for whom there is very little or no collective bargaining arrangements in place. Well, the member mentions collective bargaining, and what is more important is individual bargaining. Uh, and the truth is that farmers, um, and particularly uh, as things go, goes forward uh, with more challenges in, in bringing people from other countries uh, into Northern Ireland to, to carry out work, um, young people who want to go out in, in, in clement weather and, and work in, in, in very physical conditions um, are, are hard to get. So the best negotiating position is a negotiating position is when labour is more in demand um, than the other way around. And therefore, at this moment in time, um, those people who are working um, in the farming community can demand um, a good source of income and will get a good source of income because if the farmer needs them, the farmer is going to have to pay for them. It's as simple as that. I call Emma Sheeran. Minister, can you tell us why the scope of your plastic reduction action plan is so narrow, applying only to government buildings? Um, there are some nine different pieces of individual plastic that are involved uh, in terms of this. Um, it is our intention to, to rule things out further considerably. It is our intention to increase um, the plastic bag levy. Uh, and that is, is something that, that we're, we're currently um, doing. And we recognise the damage that plastic does. We recognise that there has been much plastic used in the past that is unrequired. And therefore, single-use plastics is something which we want to screen out um, of uh, government departments and indeed beyond. Thanks to the Minister for his answer. Minister, as you will be aware, you are required to implement the articles of the EU Single Use Plastics Directive that apply to the North and are to be transposed in July of this year. The action plan that you have produced does not uh, provide an awful lot of co confidence in your commitment to the reduction in single use plastic usage. Can you commit to uh, applying those directives as per the, the time frame? And can you go further and say that you will look at implementing the directives that you aren't required to commit because of the innovative ideas contained within? Well, you are the first person that I have heard uh, that has not had confidence in it. Uh, that has not been expressed anywhere else, so that suggests to me that it is more political than, than anything else. What I would say is that I do not need an EU directive to know the difference between right and wrong, and I believe that we should be reducing the use of plastic full stop. Um, I don't need a bureaucrat in Brussels to tell me to do that. Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, um, you'd be well aware of uh, the increased usage uh, of Loch Ness during this period of lockdown and its potential, I think, for staycation type holidays. Could you maybe outline some of your department's obligations and visions, uh, a vision for Loch Ness? Loch Ness is um, a huge asset, and I believe it has been an underutilised asset. Uh, and I have always said that um, from my er er early days of visiting Loch Ness, either at, at Antrim or, or Oxford Island. And I would love to see Loch Ness um, more utilised. It is the largest water body, um, uh, fresh water body in the United Kingdom. I think that we have tremendous opportunities um, from the agri-environment side to reduce the pollution. Uh, in Loch Ness because it has faced problems with eutrophication uh, in previous years and that, that starving of oxygen in, in the water uh, undermines uh, what we are capable of doing uh, on the Loch Ness waterway. So it is important that we take, do everything that we can to ensure that Loch Ness um, has clean waterways, um, that the, the, the land that is around Loch Ness is land which is low in, in, in phosphates in particular. And I think that there is much that we can do in terms of my green growth strategy uh, to ensure that we have a better management system of slurry and consequently 
a lot less slurry is spread in, in generations to come. That is my big aim, and that we move to um, anaerobic digestion of slurry materials and separation, uh, and then um, pelletise the phosphates as opposed to land spreading it. We do our lighter assessments. We do um, our checks uh, in terms of the nutrients in the soil and what is applied is applied appropriately, and therefore that would be of great assistance to Loch Ness going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome uh, the Minister's outline. Um, last week, Minister, you made an announcement in relation to uh, grants for the fishing industry for the Loch Ness fishermen. Could you just confirm that the application should come from licensed eel and scaled fish fishermen? Yes, the, the applications are out there, and the fishermen who fish in Loch Ness um, are entitled to, to do that on the basis of a licence. Uh, Minister, I uh, wonder if it would be possible for you to give us an update on the indicative, indicative timeline for the publication of your new rural policy? That uh, policy has, has been completed and is with me at the minute, um, so I would imagine that over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, we will be ready, ready to, to move that ahead and, and get it launched. Uh, uh, the Minister will be aware that um, the, the, the UK Share Prosperity Fund was, probably the, was the main means to finance a new rule of, rule of open policy, uh, you know, given the fact that we have lost the EU funding for it. Can the minister, does the minister have, any, minister have any update on the status of the UK Share Prosperity Fund and the likelihood of that being uh, forthcoming? Uh, no recent updates on, on, on the Prosperity Fund. Um, unlike some people, I welcome it. I think it's uh, good that we're getting that investment, and uh, I will take that support from the UK government, um, as I took the support from the European Union, and we'll work with them to seek to maximise that support and dispense it fairly and equitably across rural communities where that need is manifested. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. I, I know the Minister um, looked on in horror at the devastation that the fires caused in the Mourne Mountains and his quick response to that. Could the Minister elaborate on actions can, that can be taken by both his department and others to help the rebuild of wildlife in the Mourne Mountains following this devastation? Well, there needs to be a lot of engagement uh, with the landowners there, including the National Trust, who are a very large landowner, and we need to work very closely with them. Uh, I will uh, give you uh, a place that has worked extremely well. Uh, Glenworry um, Hills, where there has been a very close engagement with the local farming community. And as a result of the work that has been done uh, between the local farming community and NGOs, uh, we have a lot more wildlife, including species uh, which are under threat of uh, ground, ground nesting birds. There has been tremendous work done there. Um, there has been good work done in, in terms of uh, what is called term muir burning um, in those areas which is um, strip burning, and consequently we do not have the damage that is devastating damage that is caused uh, by the huge fires. The other aspect of it is that working well with local farming communities, you can ensure that there is uh, not overgrazing or undergrazing, because both of those leads to a circumstance uh, where gorse gets out of hand, and that leads to the gorse fires. Jonathan Buckley. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, you will know that um, there was such an intense reaction and, in fact, affection towards those members of our fire service that took part in that uh, blaze at the time. Could the Minister elaborate? Is there any way by which the community can get more involved to help when situations like this develop on our mountains? Well, the community response was fantastic in that they recognised um, that those uh, fire personnel were up those mountains, uh, working extremely hard. And, uh, the, the food just did not come from the Newcastle area. The Newcastle people were absolutely fantastic, but right down to Belfast and, and you know, far beyond, beyond the, the, the immediate area, uh, people were sending uh, provisions for, for the fire personnel. Uh, I do think that <coughs> in these areas where we have this quality heathland, and uh, beautiful landscapes uh, that we do need to be working with communities, um, with the NGOs, creating opportunities. I have just announced the Environmental Fund, some £2 million, and I would encourage NGOs and councils who are managing these sensitive areas 
uh, to get really good quality applications and get funding from elsewhere, maximise the support that they're getting from my department by, by, by getting support from others as well, and come forward with really good schemes uh, so that we can continue to develop uh, and build and enhance our environment. And time is up. Um, could members please take your ease for a moment or two?